There are names in sports that are evocative, that give an image of glory or power before you've ever seen them in action. Max, Bastion, Cristiano, Lance. The star of today's story doesn't have such a title. His name is Kent. Yeah, Kent, like the name of your next door neighbour or your uncle, the one with male pattern baldness and a dodgy willy. But despite his name, this lad had one hell of a career. What a massive Kent he was. Wait, that didn't come out right. In the centre of a galaxy, the stars always shine the brightest. Orbiting them are the good players, and then the also rams. Somewhere far away from the light of the stars sit the real heroes, the human protagonists. So far away from normalcy that they need a spaceship to even reach mediocrity. These are the astronauts of sports. We're both going to start and end this story at the only place we can. The start. Kent Kingsley made his debut for the North Melbourne Kangaroos a hundred days shy of his 21st birthday. Younger teammates around him had already played a smattering of games and Kent was none too pleased. He'd been on that list for three whole years by that point. Watched his team have plenty of success and been a part of absolutely none of it. He'd been unfortunate enough to be traded by an expansion team before that team had even set foot on a football field, along with his brother Wade, who hadn't even lasted to this point. If things had gone right, he'd be at Port Adelaide, gaining experience at a senior level. Instead, he'd been forced to rot away on a bench, unseen, unknown, unused. So, when he finally did get his call up, it was a rich treat to be facing his enemy, the organisation that nearly doomed his career before it ever even got started. His first goal was hardly a key forward's bread and butter. He sharked the carry contest like you'd expect, I don't know, Shannon Grant or Winston Abraham to do. Great finish, though. The next, the Joe the Goose Josh Jenkins special to steady his ruse after they'd fallen five goals back. Within a couple of minutes, young Fumble Fingers finally picks one up and gets a third. His fourth came much later, another Joe the Goose. His fifth was mere minutes afterward, coming from a nice contested mark. The final one was critical, setting up the Ruse home stretch attack, dropping into the hole about 25 out. He makes no mistake, finishing with six, second only to the mercurial Gilbert McAdam in terms of goals on debut by a kangaroo. Kingsley ended up with the three Brownlow votes and... Oh, no wait, that was Adam. But for Kent, six on his debut was well worth the wait. Afterwards, Dennis Pagan explained his rationale behind waiting so long to unleash his weapon. Now, regular viewers may remember this. The Ten. The only men who have kicked three goals with their first three kicks. Exactly none of them went on to be forward line powerhouses. But surely if a man kicks six on debut, he's destined for great things, right? Well, not really. To this point, very few men had kicked six on debut, and very few of them had had successful careers from that point. None of them, though, did what Kent Kingsley did. His fall from grace was as staggering as it was sudden. Only Richard Lounder kicked half as many goals to go kickless within a fortnight. It was a trick he would repeat later in the season, one of two kickless wonders that North somehow got a victory in spite of. He was dropped and missed yet another grand final appearance. After an awful 2000 season, he was shifted to a Geelong side who hadn't had a man in the 190s kick 50 plus in the 20 minute quarter era. He was actually struggling ex-kangaroo young key position prospect number two, following in Cam Mooney's massive footsteps. After a 2001 in which he played like a seagull carcass, he had a weird 2002. Now the leading target for the Cats, he passed 50 goals and got third in the Coleman medal, but scored a massive amount in losses. His 2003 was similar, and then 2004 happened. If there's a single number that defines King Kent as a player, it's not his six goals on debut. Not the one kick he got the next week, nor the 57 goals that his most productive season harvested. No, it's this. 50.53, his accuracy in 2004. 
Geelong fans would revel in performances like his seven straight against Essendon, then lament the next week as he kicked one goal three in a narrow loss, one of three losses that year decided by a single missed shot. And you gotta remember, this is at the same point when Matty Lloyd's doing stuff like this. He shifted up the ground slightly in 2005 as the Cats trialled a more accurate stay-at-home full forward. He got better, even hitting 57 goals again, but it was more of the same, sporadic, inaccurate, invisible when it mattered. His 2006 had to be incredible to turn the opinion of the fans. Again, his pivotal game would come against the club that most recently traded him, and again, he would take the game by the scruff of the neck. He scored in typical fashion, anonymous for large periods, before scoring in gluts. His trademark accuracy didn't take hold. He was elite on that day in every way. Again, he was on top of the footy world, vanquishing old demons. In fact, he liked vanquishing demons. This Kangaroos match doubled his tally against that team, taking him to about two per game. Against Melbourne, who were far from uncompetitive at the time, he managed 2.7 and earned a very special place in their folklore. Against mediocre Adelaide, Richmond and Hawthorne sides, he could barely get out of his own way. But against the three premiers of his era, he made them his bitches. Amazing. But this showing against yet another phenomenally mediocre bunny side showed change was around the corner. The 26-year-old was evolving as he ended his prime. Shit, who pressed B? Do you know how long it takes to level up this guy? Ah, oh, fuck this, I'm catching a tomahawk. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes! Finally a decent key forward. Let's win a premiership. Yep, it was a false dawn. Again. And again, he would suffer a catastrophic form drop off, resulting in his club no longer requiring his services. He wouldn't get a third renaissance at Richmond. He played three games for two goals. Since that amazing 2005, he'd played a dozen games, averaging a goal in each after being eight in total goals across a four-year period. That just doesn't happen. That's like if 2016 to 2019 Jack Rewalt literally just disappeared off the face of the planet by 2021. For the record, Rewalt didn't, he kicked 51 goals in a season that ended just a month shy of his 33rd birthday, at five years Kingsley's senior. In fact, let me show you just how good peak Kent Kingsley was. Even in an era where 100 goal seasons were still possible, the 2000s never generated a season where as many as 15 guys got 50 goals. Some years produced under 10. If each team played an unchanged front six, which they absolutely didn't, a random forward's chances to score 50 would be around 15%, similar odds to a 650 disposal or 500 hit-out season nowadays. In other words, elite. On average, if you do that, you're the best forward in any given team. And if not, and they cut you, you'd be the best forward in the bottom four or so teams virtually guaranteed and Kingsley did it two years in a row. And it's not like he was a goal hog. He generated 15 goal assists in both years. It doesn't sound like much, but 15 will crack the top 35 most years. And back in a 16-team comp, that puts you in the top 10%. The odds of picking any random player who is in the top 12 in scoring and top 35 in assisting is 1 in 85. The odds of doing that two years in a row jumped to over 1 in 7,000. Only three guys did both in that span. Three. One is my pick for the greatest forward of all time. One is a 500 club member and Hall of Famer. The other is Kent Kingsley. There's not many guys who've kicked 50 with 15 goal assists who've slid out of the AFL as quickly and none as quietly as Kent Kingsley. Fittingly, only Treadray has a worse return, but that was only because of an awful knee injury that came from being hit by a large potato. 
Oh, sorry, I meant a spud. Kingsley didn't have that excuse. He wasn't at the end of a 15-year career. He wasn't controversial. He wasn't suffering from any major or niggling injuries. He wasn't even 29. He was fresh off being the leading scorer and second highest assister of two finals caliber Geelong sides. And no one wanted him. And by all accounts, he was fine with that. The doubters, the naysayers, the critics, they were all on his back early, and he carried that weight his whole career. There were signs that he didn't really enjoy a lot of his football. It had taken him to accomplish something that only a couple of guys with 1,500 goals between them could do to just give Kent confidence in himself. But it wasn't enough. The goals weren't enough. He didn't play tough enough for the fans' liking, and look, the stats certainly suggest that. He played like a millionaire, which is quite interesting because, well, he was one. In 1998, before his AFL career had technically begun, Kingsley started his own IT company. Right as he was nailing six against the power, a big public software firm bought his company, reportedly for five million dollar dues, huge in 1999. He made some good investments and was really only playing footy just for the fun of it. And when he went to Richmond, he was trapped in an insipid team that actually had a far better forward line than it deserved. The exact wrong location for Big Kent. It wasn't fun anymore. He didn't need it. So, he left. He was a lift with the cables cut. Luckily, Geelong's premiership window was only on the second level, so they just took the stairs. Actually, the darn thing may as well just be on the ground floor as they've basically been resting their balls on its windowsill for the last 15 years. Today, Kent Kingsley is not remembered as a man who kicked six goals on debut, as a Coleman medal runner-up, as a frightening beast to play on in AFL Premiership 2006, or as one of only six cats to get 200 goals at two or more per game. He's remembered as someone who won a car after his girlfriend rigged the sexiest player award competition. And that's if he's remembered at all. All he's really got now is a semi-ironic award in his name on a forum post and a fully ironic Facebook page that's actually dead. He's on the outer rim of the footy world. He is a true astronaut of sports. <laughs>